This is Twit. Are America's nuclear systems so old that they're unhackable? Which is an intriguing question. Um, and I was put in mind of my meeting back in 1984, a dear friend of mine who was incredibly non-computer savvy. She was a realtor. Uh, we met when I purchased my home from her in 1984. She needed to access the Realtors MLS, the Multiple Listing Service, and she was using something at the time which she called her modem. She just called it the modem. It was actually, I was humored to see, a Texas Instruments Silent 700 thermal printing terminal. Uh, and remember with those original rubber caps or cups on top that you would press the telephone's handset down into after first dialing into some computer. Well, we became lifelong friends. Um, and when the Internet happened, this MLS service moved online. So I set her up with a Windows 95 machine. Windows 95 was, you know, current at the time. Then many years went by with everything working fine until someone she had over to her home was shocked that she was still using Windows 95. I don't recall where the rest of the world was by then, probably at least on XP. So she immediately phoned to ask why her computer had been allowed to become obsolete. And I said, Judy, does it work? Which gave her pause. And she said, uh, yes. And I said, is there anything you need to do with it that it doesn't? And she said, no. So I explained that there was a growing problem on the Internet with security. People were getting their computers hacked by clicking on the wrong thing. And she said, oh, yeah, that's happened to several of my friends. She said they got viruses in their computers that were sending out emails to all of their friends and infecting them, too. And so I said, Judy, did you receive those emails? And she said, yes. And I asked, and did you get infected, too? And she said, no. And I said, that's right. And that's because your computer is too old <laughs> to, get inf <laughs> to, to get infected by modern viruses. It uses an older and original sort of code, which is in many ways better, especially for the few things you need your computer to do. You know, basically, she just used what she called the Google which she did not understand. She did not know that the Google was not the Internet because that was what she addressed. She f confronted the Google. Um, so she continued to use that machine happily for many more years until someone convinced her to buy a new one, after which she pretty quickly got herself infected. And I sort of felt a little responsible for that because I had never needed to like lecture her on safe computing she habits. had no antibodies she exactly she had never been exposed <laughs> I, I had exactly that thought leo exactly okay so that brings us to a really interesting piece that ran in the record last week that i wanted to share some parts from it was intriguing to me and i think it will be intriguing to our listeners um because it was interesting to see how much of the general philosophy of complexity and security uh, and the if it's not broke, don't fix it philosophy, which we've developed on this podcast, uh, you know, as a matter of self-preservation through the years uh, and how much of that was in quotes from this story. So to set up their piece, the record first establishes the context of the moment they wrote. As the Cold War drew to a close, a surprising contender emerged as the third largest nuclear power on Earth, Ukraine. The country was home to some 5,000 nuclear weapons placed there by Moscow when Ukraine was still part of the Soviet Union. Kiev sent the weapons back to Russia in exchange for security guarantees from the U.S. and Britain and a promise from Moscow that it would respect Ukraine's sovereignty. Then, President Vladimir Putin invaded in February. 
the nuclear option, which many thought had been largely removed from the table, was one of the first sabers Putin chose to rattle when he announced that Russian troops were moving into Ukraine in February. He reminded the world that not only did Russia possess nuclear weapons, but it was prepared to use them. Anyone who, quote, tries to stand in our way, unquote, he said, will face consequences, quote, such as you have never seen in your entire history, unquote. The threat raised an uncomfortable question. After decades of pursuing disarmament talks and assuming nuclear confrontation was a bridge too far, was the United States ready for the ultimate confrontation with Russia? And of course, <laughs> nobody wants that. Okay, but so that's interesting. Amid all the talks of cyber offense and defense, I have found myself wondering, as I imagine our listeners may have, how strong our nuclear deterrent is in the face of reportedly quite capable foreign cyber attacking adversaries. What I'm going to share from what the record wrote uh, and which I've edited for the podcast speaks to exactly that. They said, and I've, again, I've, I've edited this to make it more understandable verbally, right up until three years ago, U.S. nuclear systems were using 8-inch floppy disks in an IBM System 1 computer first introduced in 1976. <laughs> it was not connected to the Internet and required spare parts often sourced from eBay. Some analysts think America's slow walk toward modernization of its nuclear systems may turn out to have been a canny strategy because the systems are so old, much like Judy's old Windows 95 machine, they are practically unhackable. Herb Lynn, a professor at Stanford University and author of a new book titled Cyber Threats and Nuclear Weapons, said... There is a truism about computers, which is that when we have a computer, it's, we always want it to do more. His book looks at the risks of cyber attacks across the entire nuclear enterprise. He says the more problem inevitably introduces vulnerability into systems and, def and defense officials have to think carefully about how to modernize. Amen. Please. He said, if you'll grant the point that the more you want a computer system to do, the more complex the system is that you have to build. Then you take the second step and you realize that complexity is the enemy of security. Yeah. Where have we heard that before? I think it was Admiral Adama in Battlestar Galactica, actually. <laughs> yeah? Remember, that's why Galactica survived the attack of the Cylons. He still had phones with wires on them coming out of the wall. They hadn't nice. adopted the new technology, and they were the only ship in the fleet that survived. Nice. You see? Couldn't be hacked. Yep. There it is. Yep. So, Lynn says that this is where things start to go wrong, at, and much as it happened <laughs> with, with the Galactica fleet. He said, run the probabilities, and there's a chance that one of those many complex components could be vulnerable to a hack in a way no one had considered before. The cautionary tale is Stuxnet, the virus and worm that found its way into the Natanz uranium enrichment plant in Iran in 2009 and 2010. Stuxnet, which appears in, in this writing to have been the brainchild of U.S. and Israeli intelligence services, was able to take control of centrifuges used to enrich uranium gas inside the giant plant. And without anyone noticing, get them to spin so fast they broke. For a long time, the cause of the centrifuge failures was a complete mystery. Scientists were fired. Officials thought they were sleeping on the job or not maintaining the systems properly. 
It never occurred to anyone until much later that a cyber weapon could possibly find its way into a system that was air-gapped from the Internet and so closely watched. Stuxnet had probably been in their systems a year before they even discovered it. And, of course, this is a cautionary tale because it suggests that maybe sticking with eight-inch floppies was a good idea. The thinking has been, they write, that America's geriatric nuclear weapons systems may actually provide an inoculation from this kind of attack. Lynn wrote, many of the systems right now are so old that there's nobody or few, very few people who know how to get at them. So right now, the current assessment is that the nuclear command and control system, anyway, is mostly robust against a cyber threat. And, of course, that bar is high. When you say when you're going to say we're robust against, you know, the nuclear command and control system being compromised. Good. Hayat Alvi, a professor at the U.S. Naval War College, studies these kinds of nuclear weapons issues. She spoke to the record in her personal capacity. She says she has a mantra when it comes to our nuclear weapons systems, and I love it. If it's not broken, it doesn't need to be fixed. Alvi says the calculus is pretty simple. Why try to change something that has worked for decades? Assuming you change them to upgrade them to modern technology, you are actually inviting more risks and potential threats and sabotage into the system. While officials have tinkered at the edges of the nuclear weapons systems, John Lauder, who used to direct the CIA's Non-Proliferation Center, says most of the systems we're using are from the 70s and 80s. And I'll just remind everybody that, you know, we've been like staring at the chips on motherboards, which all come from China, you know, like wondering and worrying whether that EEPROM like might be more than it looks like or whether that, you know, the Ethernet connector could have a chip hidden, you know, inside it. It's, so it's like, you know, just please leave everything alone. He said, there has been a general sense from people who worked in arms control that, quote, we had put together a set of agreements that would keep peace and stability. As a result, modernizing nuclear weapons systems seemed less important since there was a general sense that the weapons would eventually be phased out. But Ukraine, he said, was a wake-up call. In 1979, about three years after the U.S. nuclear weapons program adopted that state-of-the-art at the time IBM Series 1 computer, William Perry, who was a top Pentagon official at the time, got a phone call. The voice on the other end identified himself as the watch officer. Perry who would later go on to be defense secretary in the Clinton administration, recounted in his podcast, At the Brink. He said, The first thing the watch officer said to me was that his computers were showing 200 nuclear missiles on the way inbound from the Soviet Union to the United States. And for one horrifying moment... He said, I believed we were about to witness the end of civilization. I mean, this actually happened. As Perry weighed the possibilities, he concluded this had to be some kind of mistake. There was nothing going on in the world at the time that would have caused the Soviet Union to suddenly strike. Perry asked the watch commander to find out what had gone wrong with the systems so he could explain what happened to the president in the morning. It turns out someone had accidentally put a training tape into the computer instead of an operating one. As a result, what the computer saw was a simulation of an actual attack. It looked real because it was designed to look real. Perry says that night... 
fundamentally changed the way he thought about nuclear weapons. He came to the conclusion that simple human error could indeed lead to nuclear war. He said, quote, it has changed forever my way of thinking about nuclear weapons. Up until this, a false alarm, an attack by mistake, starting a nuclear war by mistake was a theoretical issue until it wasn't. So, there have been many questions raised and interesting movies made surrounding the question of whether a human being would be able to follow an order, would choose to follow an order, to turn the keys to launch a strike. So, understandably, there's a huge urge on the part of those who are given the responsibility of protecting us to remove the human factor from the loop on the basis that it introduces a wild card, an unknowable uncertainty that cannot be relied upon. The good news is that there are now so very many lessons which have since been learned about the true fragility of our supposedly advanced technology that it's at least reasonable to hope that ultimate control will not be centralized. And after all, all of the strength of the Internet arises from its inherently and brilliantly decentralized design. You know, the, the good news is that, you know, William Perry was in the loop, got the call, did like a reality check and said, wait a minute, this, it makes no sense that this could add, that there's actually 200 inbound nukes from the, the Soviet Union. You know, let's double check our systems. So anyway, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, uh, a little bit of, I thought, interesting insight that that because... Our weapons just, you know, we, no one has believed we were going to probably ever need these things again. Uh, you know, I'm sure they're being dusted. <laughs> you know, oil is, is you know, they're, they're, they're kept in functioning condition. But the technology has been pretty much left as it was in the 70s and 80s. And I say good because, you know, the only way... The only way it would be safe would be if if we ourselves designed the chips and used our own foundries to make them and built systems that did it like from this from the sand on the beach up to working silicon in order to function. Everything else, everything in our systems these days, we get, you know, offshore. And uh, the world has changed too much uh, recently.